All right, everybody getting live, live and ready to go with our lecture on the aerobic myth of fat loss, along with uh, my buddy, protege, whatever you want to say, Andy Hello, Sinclair. Everybody. All right. So, um, yeah, so going to wait while people are um, joining up, waiting for the viewers to tune in because we have a bit of a delay here. Got a little bit of a rant to go on. Um, before we get to the, the aerobic myth of fat loss. And one of the things is I told you guys a few weeks back, I talked to you about one of the troublesome natures of the internet is the way you get a following on the internet, say outrageous stuff, do outrageous stuff, build a tribe of ignorant people, and then serious people have to come along and debunk the nonsense that you're talking about. I call it the Donald Trump syndrome. But anyway... What happened is a few weeks ago, I mentioned to you guys, this guy that's getting all kinds of um, social media play because he only eats meat. Uh, I call him Dr. Uh, Dr. Meat Eater because I don't want to give his name any more attention than it's already getting. Uh, I'd like to call him Dr. Meathead, but that would be politically incorrect. Um, and it seems to me that people who were uh, talking about this guy failed to keep mentioning that he lost his... Um, license to practice medicine for unethical practices. But other than that, here's a man who claims to eat nothing but meat uh, in the face of everything going on vegan style. Well, here's what has transpired since I first mentioned him is that he finally got a blood test done. And why this is worth mentioning in a rant is because the level of friggin' denial and rationalization that has gone on here is absolutely incredible. So Dr. Meat Eater finally got his blood work done. He was resistant to doing that when I first mentioned his name. And long story short, most of his blood numbers are terrible. I mean, they're really terrible, borderline, borderline diabetic, high cholesterol. But what stood out the most to me, not only his way of dismissing any numbers that represented ill health, any numbers that he didn't like, he went on a babble, babble-a-thon of stuff that didn't even make sense. Basically, when we have blood tests that doctors around the world believe in and adhere to in terms of health markers and risks of illness, and this meat eater guy uh, blood panel comes back and it's a mess, it's a complete mess. But to hear the level of denial really strikes me in terms of nutrition and training that people will just want to keep believing that, you know, denial is a river in Egypt and it's not something that they're actually practicing uh, when it comes. So he had numbers that showed that his meat only diet sucks. And yet the way they try to talk around it and deny it and rationalize it and Babylonia about it, uh, Babel baloney about it, uh, I couldn't believe it. So uh, you can search for that online if you want. But the other thing about it was, of all the numbers of his that were terrible, his testosterone was ridiculously terrible. So here's someone who claimed to only eat meat. And the question Andy and I get all the time is, what about protein? What about protein? What about protein? And this guy's testosterone was about the level you would see in a man 90 to 100 years old. I mean, it was just terrible. And you should hear him rationalize why that could be a good thing. It was just off the chart silly. Um, and I, and I had to, I had to mention it because, oh, well, Tiffany's saying she has a friend doing this diet. That's the problem. Um, you know, uh, boy, um, ignorance loves company, idiots love company. But like I said, get online, say outrageous stuff and you'll gather a following just from saying outrageous stuff. And then serious people have to come and debunk everything you've said. And uh, that's what's going on here. This guy's an idiot, doctor or no doctor, even though he lost his license. And, um, and he goes out and gets a blood test finally, and his numbers are terrible, and he's still in denial of it. So uh, you can go on social media and see some pretty smart uh, vegan uh, cookies, rip them a new one on there in terms of the actual numbers. So any comments on that, buddy, before we get to the comment, uh, the subject at hand? That, that's all he eats is just meat. Well, that's what he claims, but uh, I believe it now that I've seen his blood tests. I didn't believe it at first, but with his blood test numbers being yeah, as ridiculously yeah. bad as they are, um, yeah, wow. I think any any diet that's that one-sided, I, I think that's a 
that's a warning sign. That's a red flag right off the bat, right? So, but not to mention, if you're going to be one sided, be one sided on the side of health, not what we yeah. now know about ill health. I mean, absolutely. Um, it, it, you know, anyway, we can we can we can really dive into that another time. But I do not want to mention his name. He doesn't deserve any more attention, especially from smart people. Um, but I'll just mention how ridiculous that is. And I'll get to your comments, folks. Um, so, yeah, today is all about revisiting the aerobic myth of fat loss. It seems like no matter when, when did I write the able approach, Andy, 10 years ago? About yeah, the first yeah. edition. Yeah, probably 2006, maybe even 12 years so, ago. Yeah. yeah, I have a whole chapter in there on the aerobic myth of fat loss. Nothing's changed, but nothing's changed. So mm -hmm. I keep having to revisit the same old stuff in the same old way. So we're going to bring up PowerPoint uh, presentation now, folks, and I'll get it to where uh, you can see it best. Uh, let me see here. You guys let me know what uh, vision is best for you guys to see this. We'll get uh, shrink Andy and I. So hopefully you guys can all see that. And I want to get to the A to Z aerobic myth of fat loss, starting with some kindergarten physiology basics. And Andy, feel free to jump in anytime, but I'll, I'll go slide by slide and then I'll let you talk or I'll try to. Uh, and then we'll get to your comments, folks, of course. So let's start with the kindergarten nature of understanding physiology. What is the nature of treadmill, elliptical, rowing machine, exercise bike, Stairmaster? The answer is they are cardiovascular in nature. What is the nature of resistance training, weight training workouts? The answer, they are neuromuscular in nature. So let's talk about the beginning of a workout. So the point, why do I point that out? Well, therefore, how is doing a treadmill or a rower or an elliptical or a Stairmaster or an exercise bike serving as an effective warm up for weight training? It's not. This is the equivalent of, of a student saying that they have a major exam in English Lit tomorrow, so they're going to study some algebra first uh, to prepare. Or another example would be, since we live in Canada and go through some pretty harsh winters, this is like thinking you're going to warm up your car in the winter by going outside and starting the engine, but not turning on the heat, the defrost, or the seat warmers. So you might be warming up the engine, but you're not warming up the car. So we have to start with something as basic as watching people walk into a gym and walk over to the cardio equipment and think that they're warming up for uh, uh, an effective weight training workout. Not only that, but most of this cardio stuff, if you start with it with a cold body, you're going to tighten up the psoas muscles in the legs, which could make even for tighter muscles that uh, you don't want before training with weights. Go ahead, Bunny, and then I'll switch uh, to the yeah, next slide. I, I think it's such a monkey see, monkey do uh, type mentality. People just, they see other people warming up on, on cardio equipment. So, you know, that's, that's what they do, right? So um, actually, Gambetta has a really good quote. On, I'm going uh, yeah, to get to oh, him. I added do that you have quote. that one? Okay, yeah. Yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll let you say that. But, well, if you um, can hold off till that becomes relevant, I know the exact quote you're talking about. So, yeah, um, yeah. But, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's pretty much 90% of the gym population probably warms up on a piece of. Well, think, they think they warm up. They think they're warming yeah, up. Yeah, exactly. Right. It, it's just wasted gym time. That's all it is. But. Exactly. It's what we call junk volume. Yeah. Um, you know, people wonder why we look the way we look spending so little time in the gym. It's because we don't do junk volume. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Someone asked me today, some jokingly is like uh, pointed at, how come I never see you on the, and pointed over to the cardio equipment. I said, I'm allergic. So <laughs> people don't. Uh, so let's talk relevance here. And this is just the warm up part, folks. I mean, yeah. what bothers me here isn't so much about what, what Andy's saying. Gym members who don't know any better is like, you know, we the sheeple. But the personal trainers who have their clients warm up on these machines, standing beside them with their clipboard or whatever, the fact that a personal trainer doesn't know any better is a travesty to me in terms of what passes for knowledge out there these days, because this knowledge has been around for as long as we've understood the principles of exercise physiology. Even today, I saw uh, someone who teaches classes come in, walk on the treadmill for 15, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and then get off. And I'm thinking, 
what is it that they think they've just accomplished? I don't understand. So, yeah, anyway. you, you never saw Arnold warm up on a bike or <laughs> a treadmill and pumping iron, right? Like, a, and that was back yeah. in the seventies. So, yeah, you know, and and it was back then. yeah, and the more we look at uh, as science and research continues to accumulate, we see that the good peer-reviewed research is actually reinforcing a lot of the stuff these guys did just by understanding biofeedback and reading it and following it. So we're going to get into the whole aerobic myth of fat loss, but, you know, I want to build up to that argument first by, you know, people even mm -hmm. thinking that these machines somehow contain some magical mystical force or power that we need to engage with them uh, as part of our workout. So we need to talk energy systems and understand the biochemistry, metabolic expression that fat burns in a carbohydrate flame. And I've mentioned this several times. So if you do your cardio before your weight workouts, this makes no sense. And we'll talk about that in relevance to the Vern Gambetta quote that I'm sure that's what the one you mean. Um, but if you do want to take advantage of some post-workout fat burning, then your cardio, quote unquote, should come after your weight training, not before. Once your glycogen kindling has been ignited and spent, then your body will more likely surrender more freely free fatty acids. And that's very, very limited, as we'll see from the research. So uh, why do so many women have this equation backwards? There's so many ladies in my gym that... I wish in my younger days, I just want to approach them because I feel bad for them. I see them there every day, which means that they're there as often as I am and way they go on the elliptical and then they finish their workout with some mediocre level resistance training. And I'm thinking, man, talk about having it backwards if you're really trying to alter your physique. The other thing we need to know there about energy systems is the fuel economy of fat loss. And in the book, The Able Approach, I explain to people the aerobic machinery. It's a lot like buying a vehicle when you're concerned about gas mileage. You go to the dealership. How many miles to the gallon does this get? this car gets. So you're buying a fuel efficient engine. And when you do aerobic exercise, that's what you're training. You're training your fat machinery to burn less, not more. And people don't seem to understand that. So after a first initial period, it's the law of not only diminishing returns, but negative returns. In other words, to burn a little bit of fat that you used to burn at 20 minutes, then you have to do 30 minutes, then you have to do 40 minutes, then you have to do an hour to get the same effect you used to get, you know, in the initial stages. And people don't seem to understand fuel economy of aerobic machinery is a lot like a uh, fuel economy of choosing a car that gets better gas mileage because you have to go longer to burn that gallon of gas. What you really want is you want a kick-ass engine that can haul ass and 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 burn and, and perform like Andy's big giant truck that can haul a bunch of stuff in it. That's the kind of engine you want to train. That's the kind of metabolic machinery you want. You don't want to downsize your engine for fuel economy uh, because that's going to not reap your rewards in terms of um, anabolic activity and cosmetic effects uh, down the line. So, um that's important. So Miranda, I'll get to your comment later, but that comment is is uh, patently inaccurate. Um, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Um, anyway, we'll, we'll get to that. And comments, buddy, before I get to the next one? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, the, the more often you do cardio, I mean, the, the less effective it becomes over time, right? So that's why uh, when I throw stuff in, it's, it's usually walks and, and hikes outside, but it's for, you know, a short period of time in, in the spring and summer. And that's what makes it effective. That's what keeps my metabolism, uh, you know, a, a, a V8 engine as opposed to, you know, a smart car or something. Right. So. Yeah. And we'll talk, we'll talk yeah, about we'll, we'll situational, that, right? yeah, situational absolutely. hyper metabolism. We're going to talk about further uh, down the road. You know, the person that does 45 minutes five days a week after every workout, I mean, that only becomes, you know, that, that's only well, that's, effective for so long, right? So, you know, 12 months of the year. The couple people I've engaged at the gym trying to explain to them, I see them on the, on the 
the cardio equipment at the beginning of their workout and I see them on the cardio equipment at the end of their workout or you see people who are trying to lean out and they're doing cardio all year long they've got nowhere to go if you're already already doing everything then the only yeah. solution there is it's like it's like trying to burn a, a full tank of gas in a fuel economy car right. how are you going to do that you got to drive farther and farther and farther to do that so it makes no sense but let's get to the actual research in terms of let's switch to the fat burning element of that. And uh, Miranda, by all means, uh, if I, you know, when I'm finished here, re remind me to get to your point. Um, but I think it'll speak for itself when we, when we get done. Um, so let's talk about aerobic activity and fat loss. What, what people, most people call cardio equipment. What does the research say? Now I'm going to go through the most popular research, the research that's been around the longest, the research that most people refer to, even though there's way more research I could have called up, but I didn't want to turn this into a three or four part article or a webinar. You can go to my book, The Able Approach, for more on that. But let's start with this first famous study, 1998, the Journal of Sports Nutrition. The findings here, and you can look up that volume, 12 weeks of 45 minutes of aerobic training had no effect, and I put in red here, absolutely zero effect on body composition over dieting alone for that period of time. Now, for me, that sure seems to be a tremendous waste of gym time over a three-month period, given the fact that time seems to be people's most precious commodity these days. Don't you want to make the most efficient use of your time in exercise? And I would say most people, unless they're really lying, uh, want some kind of cosmetic result from their fitness activity. So uh, you comment on that, buddy, and I'll get to the next piece of research. Yeah, I mean, staying staying lean is is all diet strategy, right? So, I mean, it's it's not yeah. like diet and it's diet yeah. strategy in terms of fat loss, but also in terms of metabolism, which yeah. people don't understand at all. Um, even the vegans that I research make very little uh, discussion of metabolism. So, I think we're ahead in that department. So, let's look at now. This is the same research, International Journal of Sports Nutrition, nineteen ninety eight. The hypothesis going in was, does adding aerobic exercise burn more fat? This is what people want to know. This is what we often get attacked for by people saying, well, that's your opinion. Uh, no, it's not our opinion. This is evidence-based stuff, and I'll get to the actual real-world evidence in, in uh, you know five or ten minutes down the road. But um, So this was the hypothesis of the research, and the findings of this study were that 45 minutes of aerobic exercise, like your elliptical, at 78% maximum heart rate, five days a week for 12 straight weeks, had no effect, capital boom, shika boom, boom, bam, no effect over dieting alone on promoting fat loss. Therefore, this is a four-month waste of time since it has no effect on fat loss. So why are you doing it? Go ahead, buddy. Yeah, and, and everyone thinks that the cardio is the you know the gold standard of fat loss too. I mean, I, I haven't done any in probably you know a, at least a decade, maybe even oh, more. Yeah. Like like structured cardio at the gym, right? So, and I mean, people they think it's yeah, like the yeah. Uh, you're spoiling my uh you're spoiling my later uh my later uh yeah i, I, I won't go too far into here. that but i mean it's <laughs> just everyone just assumes that they need to be you know on even a worse or elliptical I, I saw a couple ladies well I've, I've seen them do it a few times they'll do uh a one hour boot camp class and then they hop on like a treadmill or elliptical right after like that's they're doing that's, like two hours of, of aerobic work straight like that. That's insane. And it's the, the very definition of junk volume. Um, yeah. In other words, you've already had you've already had any benefit that you're going to get and you're not going to get any more. What people don't seem to realize is because we also get the trainers who think they know and they kind of smirk over when you're out of breath or grunting and groaning with the weights. They think that somehow they're in better shape because they're on a piece of cardio equipment when the research is pretty clear if you understand energy systems that training resistance training actually increases aerobic fitness but the reverse is never true aerobic fitness is never going to increase strength and power it's actually going to diminish them and we'll get to that as well so this is important stuff that goes all the way down the track and it's important that people understand that so let's go let's continue some research 
uh, the Journal of Clinical Endocrine Metabolism, January 2007, and their hypothesis, what is the effect of diet plus aerobic training on body composition? Findings of this study, 50 minutes, that's almost an hour of aerobic training performed five days a week over six months, no additional effects on body composition. Therefore, six months waste of time if fat loss is your goal. I feel bad for the people that keep buying into this stuff, but this is the research that went to look at this to try to say, what's the best way to lose fat? What's the best way to sculpt your body? Boom, it's not with this activity. So let's, uh, let's, let's get uh, into some more research here. Uh, Obesity Journal, 2007, their hypothesis was, what are the exercise effects on weight and body fat in men and women? This was a 12 month, in other words, one year whole study looked at six hours of aerobic training per week. So you can see the research I chose goes up and up and up in aerobic training. So it was an hour a day, six days a week. And the average weight loss, get this folks, was 0.5 pounds a month, a month. <laughs> so that's half a pound of fat loss, like eight ounces a month. Okay, I lose that taking breath between sets at the gym. This is absolutely ridiculous, and that's half a pound a month. And the researchers noted, and I put it in here on purpose, and I'm gonna bold it, and I'm gonna underline it right now. The researchers noted these results were even poorer for the women in the study. Women who tend to be the ones who opt for this type of exercise the most in order to burn fat and lose weight, their results were even worse. How can you get worse than an hour a day of cardio six days a week and the results of that are less, is half a pound a month? Please, that just freaks me out that people are, are that invested in, in a time waste. So uh, go ahead, buddy, comment on yeah, that. that we'll that's the next that's a lot of work for no return on, uh, on your investment. I mean, it's no wonder people get so frustrated, right? Um, and and the, they just end up quitting. And the comments are coming in fast and furious, guys, and great. I'm going to get to them all, I promise. Just I want to form the argument and then uh, get, to the, get to your comments, which are great. I recognize some names in here. So uh, just bear with us till we get through the lecture because I don't want to bounce back and forth too much and lose people with uh, the argument that I'm forming. But wow, imagine going to the gym six days a week and diligently – promoting yourself, you know, sticking to an hour of cardio a day, six days a week and stepping on the scale week in and week out. And after a month, you've lost half a pound. Uh, mm -hmm. Unbelievable uh, uh, to me. What a colossal waste of time. And again, and then again, what bothers me worse, I feel bad for the people who don't know any better, but I feel mad about the trainers who are advocating this nonsense with their yeah. clients and they don't know any better and shame on them. So, and that's pretty much ubiquitous. That's pretty much 90% of trainers everywhere who think there's some magic in that elliptical machine. Let's continue the research. And uh, 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 at the end of every slide, buddy, just jump in. I'm not gonna keep inviting you and because I'm yeah, interrupting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. I'll, I'll hop on. So, from the journal Metabolism, this is 1994, and notice how I'm going through different journals. I'm not sticking to just one kind of paradigm blindness that looks at exercise in only one way. So in this journal, Metabolism, one of my favorite journals, as you can imagine why, given the cycle diet and everything, impact of exercise intensity on body fatness and skeletal muscle metabolism. Here's the kicker that most women don't get and need to know. Does more calories burn during training yield more fat loss? This study looked at 20 weeks of endurance training versus 15 weeks of interval training. Here's the findings. Findings were that while the interval group burned less than half the calories during training, this group also showed, check it out, nine times greater fat loss than the endurance group. Boom, pam, pow, boom, chicka, boom, boom. What is this saying? Well, what do you see when you watch all these commercials for your Bowflex tread climber and all this? Oh, our study shows three times more calories burned in uh, three sessions at 20 minutes a session. Calories burned does not equate to fat loss. And this is even more pronounced. If you look at people doing the weight training, the way Andy does it, the way I do it, 
with no cardio. We're burning less calories than you are jumping around in your group class, high level intensity group class, more power to you to do it. But yes, you're burning more calories. You're not burning more fat. Research is pretty clear on this. That's why I always talk about this journal, Metabolism. Metabolism trumps nutrition when it comes to understanding this stuff. So, you know, therefore, people jumping around in group classes to burn more calories, you may indeed accomplish burning more calories, but it doesn't mean you're burning more fat. It doesn't mean you're leading out just do an observational study in your gym someday of the people coming to those exercise classes every day and leaving and watch them over six months and how many of them change. So again, women in particular don't understand this. And I've talked about it in previous lectures that it's a, like a bank account. If you're only thinking about what you're spending and not what you're saving and investing, um, then you're going to come out on the losing end of that. Go ahead, buddy. Yeah. Uh Metabolism first, for sure. Uh, endurance training um, it is not uh, doesn't put metabolism first. And you're right. Uh, look look around at your gym and and look at the people that do the most cardio. Are are they the most ripped year round? No, I mean they're not. Or so I mean that you, don't even need, you don't even need research. I mean just look around. Uh, you know that. Uh, real world uh, results. I mean, it's, uh, Oh, we're, yeah. And we're going to get, we're going to get to some real world eye popping yeah. results. Just hold with us folks. So I want to like, I'm still building the argument here, but uh, here's another one from the journal of American college of nutrition. And these are famous studies, folks. This, like I said, this is in my book, the able approach. It's 10 years old. So, and, and I go into the gym every day and it's mind boggling to me that this isn't common kindergarten level knowledge of personal trainers as again reflects why I say certified doesn't mean qualified because as far as I'm concerned, this is fitness understanding 101. This isn't complicated stuff. Anyway, sorry about my rant. Journal of American College of Nutrition, 1999. Effects of resistance training versus aerobic training combined with 800 calorie liquid diet and examining the effects on lean body mass and resting metabolic rate. There's that term again, resting metabolic rate. So in this study, the aerobic group exercised four times a week. Listen to this. The resistance training group exercised three times a week. Both groups increase max VO2. What did I say earlier? Training with weights actually increases aerobic fitness. The reverse is not true. Here's a result that shows that in spades. Here's the conclusion in red. But the resistance training group lost significantly. Look at the word significantly more fat and did not lose did not lose any lean body mass, even at 800 calories. Furthermore, the resistance training group actually increased metabolism. Boom, shake boom, boom. Contra yeah, and that, don't forget, according to the previous study, that's while burning less calories in that activity. Contra and they train less often. This study, the aerobic people four days a week, the resistance trainers three days a week, Contrarily, the aerobic training group, they lost lean body mass and therefore their metabolism slowed, the result of deamination. And I can explain that to people who want me to explain it. But the aerobic training group, they may step on the scale and see a loss of weight. But guess what? It wasn't fat. And that's not good because it's going to downregulate your metabolism, your resting metabolism. These are the realities of human biochemistry energy system and adoptive response to specific stimulation, AKA the said principle of exercise physiology. This is not opinion. I've just spent cross-referenced different journals to show you how this is understood across the board among experts who research this stuff, whether they're researching obesity, metabolism, weight loss, strength. Uh, why don't Trainers seem to possess this rudimentary level of knowledge. Go ahead, buddy. That's why we train the way we do in this camp. Um, like I said, I haven't I haven't done cardio, uh, structured cardio at the gym, and you know, well over a decade. So, uh, proof's in the pudding. I mean, we don't. Uh, there's a reason. It, it's not like I'm a, a freak of nature and I don't have to. It's, it's just, well, that's it's, uh, that's the kind of talk back yeah, we get. Uh, exactly. you know, from people and, you know, we're going to show, we're going to, you know, hang with us folks. Cause this is going to get better and better. Um, but I got to lay out the argument. 
because people think, oh, well, that's your opinion. You know, my trainer said or whatever. Well, this is beyond yeah. opinion. I just I just presented you the research. Um, so, you know, uh, let, let's get to the conclusions thus far. A quick cross section of the research illustrates the futility of cardio slash aerobic to establish cosmetic change. What people don't understand and ladies don't understand, if you are a cardio queen and you do drop weight doing that, because you're going to drop as much lean tissue as fat tissue, even if you do it right and diet th diet really strictly throughout that, your body shape's not going to change. You're still going to have most of your fat where it always was. The only thing that can change that is weight training. So I follow up this question. Look at this. The futility of cardio aerobic to establish cosmetic change. I just gave you a cross section of the research that proves this is futile. So I follow up with this question to the ladies that the above studies clearly show aerobic, aerobic training has nil effect on fat loss and body comp. Then what difference would it make doing it on an empty stomach? Answer, no difference. Your fasted cardio. So. It has no bearing on anything. So, um, and yeah, then, yeah, I, I like I like my client Aaron Chagall's comment that just came in. He post posted that to me on one of his check-ins. He, he checked in with me a while back and said, oh, coach, I, I have to do tell you I missed my cardio again today. That's 10 years now. So that's uh, that's what one of my clients jokes. So uh, we'll, we're going to get to your comments, though. So uh, comment, buddy. You want to add anything before I move yeah, on? You'll, you'll never sculpt a body with with cardio and, and aerobic training, right? I mean, people seem to think they're going to chisel themselves by doing more. And I mean, if you look at, you know, a, a marathon runner compared to a sprinter, who's who's more chiseled? Obviously, the sprinter is. So Yeah. Who's more muscular, athletic yeah. looking, especially yeah. ladies who want to like they want to tighten up the buns. They want to lift and round their glutes. Well, you're not going to yeah. do that on an elliptical machine. You're not going to do that by tying one of those exercise oh. uh, straps to your thighs and well, doing with a bucket, but you know, doing side oh. strides on the treadmill like you, you, they do not understand the principles of energy systems and exercise physiology. But in particular, ladies, what difference would it make doing it on an empty stomach? No difference yeah. at all. So let's get to, uh, here's um, Alan Cosgrove, who basically started this uh, understanding way back when. Uh, he's been on my podcast before. He's a colleague, training specialist, author of 10 of the best-selling fitness books in history. He wrote the programs in the New Rules for Lifting for Women. Uh, he writes for Men's Health and others. Um, here's his quote, quite simply, aerobic training is grossly overrated, overrated for health overrated for performance and definitely overrated for fat loss. Boom. My personal opinion, this is Alan talking, is that it is practically useless for fat loss, useless for fat loss, useless for fat loss. But the real problem is aerobic training's detrimental effect on strength and hypertrophy work. And that's where Andy, I think, wanted to throw in the Vern Gambetta quote. Vern Gambetta is the author of the book, Athletic Development, which should be must reading 101 for anyone who wants to further their fitness understanding. That book is one of the top five that should be read. And Vern Gambetta's quote was, training for an aerobic base turns jumpers into joggers. And for people who don't understand what that means or why it's important, jumping requires what? It requires power. Power is what? Power is strength expressed with speed. So if you're turning jumpers into joggers, that means you're robbing them of two of the things that make for a powerful, strong body, which results in an athletic look, et cetera, et cetera. I assume that's the quote you were going to refer to. If actually, you have another I, one. I, I had one regarding uh, uh, the warm up. actually. It was, no, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, he, he's basically just saying, um, and quote, uh, too much emphasis is placed on raising the core temperature and heart rate in the warm up. That's the, the answer to Miranda's uh, statement yeah, earlier. Go ahead. The go ahead. Physiological objective is, is neural activation and getting everything firing to, to prepare for the more intense work to follow. So that's why we do our GPP warm up and then we go into our, our warm up sets, right? Because that's what we'll be doing during the actual workout. So, 
neural activation. So uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to ask you to hold on to that quote, Andy, and and yeah. we'll use it we'll, we'll use it when we answer. I think her name was Miranda earlier uh, when she was quoting someone else who recommended. Uh, cardio to warm up the core or whatever it was. So yeah. uh, we're gonna, so now let's get to some real world stuff. Here's one example. So I've given you the research. Well, I want evidence-based stuff. Well, I've given you the research evidence, the academic evidence. Now let's give some real world, real people, real results evidence. Here's uh, Byron who was on my podcast the other week. The first thing I did with Byron when he signed up for coaching was I literally got him off the treadmill at 280 pounds or whatever it was. He was finishing his workout with jump volume on the treadmill. No, let's invest that time if you have it in your actual weight training workouts, which is where his experience lied. He lost 50 pounds in three months with me. It's been more than that now. Now he's even got abs and stuff. Wait till next time he's on my show, folks. You're going to just be like blown away. And guess what? We removed his cardio. We removed his aerobic. So not doing cardio, using his gym, gym time more efficiently. Shout out to Byron for sticking uh, with it and trusting the process. The goal is the process and the process is the goal. First thing we did with Byron, get him off, literally got him off the treadmill that he was doing at the end of his workout. Uh, which was at that weight, terrible for his uh, hip alignment and his knees. And uh, look at the results. Three months, he started January 1st, New Year's, and by the end of March, 50 pounds lighter and uh, no cardio. And, of course, there's Andy. This is a shot of Andy last year when we were shooting the hard gainer solution. Uh, somebody quilted those abs. Out. I'm not sure who did that. But, um, again, uh, over a decade, no cardio. Um, so we're just – following the principles of exercise physiology and energy systems as they're laid out. So we're following the principles. You can read them all on my ABLE approach. And then if you work the plan, the plan works. So, and then here's Andy two days ago. And the reason uh, I'm posting this one is in reference to my rant at the beginning with that uh, Dr. Meathead who only eats meat and his testosterone being uh, ridiculous as a man in his 90s. Here's Andy two days ago answering the question, what about my protein and what happens to your body? So uh, we're going to name Andy the meatless, uh, meatless and masculine or the virile vegan, whatever one you guys like, you can type it in there. But uh, And hopefully throughout this webinar, I keep forgetting you guys because I, I always get too excited about my rants and my raves and my, and my uh, presentations. But you should be hitting your shares and your likes and your emoticons and stuff. Facebook likes that and draws more people into arguments that people need to hear. So this is Andy two days ago, the virile vegan and uh, meatless and masculine. That's my... Uh, that's the Ooh, two alliterations yeah. I came up for you there, buddy. So uh, any comments on that? I mean, I want to continue. I don't want to get too far off into that. We can talk about that topic again. Uh, it seems to be a lot of interest in it. But, um, you know, any just quick comment on the vegan thing? Yeah, I mean, uh, so far, so good. I'm loving it. Um, you know, uh, protein is not an issue. B12 is not an issue. Iron is not an issue. So your energy is good. Your Weight performance. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel fantastic. Energy, um, you know, I, my diet's eighty percent carbs. So, I mean, how how could I not have energy, right? <laughs> and according and according to the keto idiots, uh, you know, you're going to have diabetes and gain weight and be yeah, fat. Yeah. And I, I can see that your body is disappearing by going vegan. You look terrible. So, yeah. anyway, yeah. let's. Uh, okay, so another real world example. A lot of you may have recognized JP from. Uh, previous look how we transformed jp's body no cardio uh, on the able program surfing the curve uh, hard gainer solution physique after 50 uh, and he's maintained that i don't use people who haven't maintained it so very important and another client of mine ollie love this guy um, Ollie has, uh, he's a little smaller in stature, but Ollie's gone from, uh, what you see on the left there, about 185, 190 pounds. He's now, uh, between 130 and 135 pounds. And that's him holding out the sweatpants that he used to wear, uh, on the left. Uh, and as you can see, he's got abs, he's ripped, uh, no cardio at all. And of course the lovely Krista, uh, no cardio at all. Uh, you can see that, you know, Krista's, um, Got the shape most women would kill for, lifted, round, tight glutes. Um, one of the things I would say about watching Krista in the gym is I wouldn't wish 
anyone to say it should, they'd like to train with her with all the squats and uh, deadlifts and stuff she does. If anyone just came in off the street and said, I think I'll train with you, um, they wouldn't be able to walk for a month. But um, <laughs> comment, comment. Go ahead, Andy, on all those pictures you just saw or and or Krista or whatever. Yeah, every, everyone looks fantastic and, and healthy, too. Um, you know, sometimes when people... Point. Sometimes when people lose weight with other people, I've, you know, I've, they almost look uh, um, emaciated, right? Like they don't look healthy. They don't. Emaciated, panda eyes. Yeah, yeah, because their diet strategy is, was awful. And then they, they did a lot of, a lot of endurance cardio work and they just kind of, you know, melted away. They lost weight, but it wasn't good weight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good point. You can see in all these people, I just showed all my clients. And there's another common thread too, folks. What do all these people have in common? They have a coach. They have me coaching them so they're not wasting their gym time. Byron didn't lose 50 pounds in three months at any other time before joining with me. He was always struggling to be on the right diet and the right program. So uh, so those real world results along with um, you know, the research that we presented. But there's one more piece of research, again, being so big on metabolism that I really want to present. The National Institute of Health, let's look at the metabolic effects of your aerobic component of your workout. The National Institute of Health did a study in a very elaborate facility that uses a room calorimeter that can measure oxygen uptake and respiration rates of people over a 24 hour period. What they did is they tested ultra marathon and triathletes, we're talking about the best of the best, uh, against average couch potatoes, um, and they found no difference in metabolism in a 24 hour period when vital stats were controlled. In other words, even endurance athletes at the very high end of the scale, training for Ironmans and doing you know six or eight hour workouts a day, um, they don't get a metabolic payoff for doing that kind of exercise. They were the same as couch potatoes if you subtracted the calories burned from their workout, which is going to be inordinate when you're doing four or five, six hours of training a day. So other than the calories burned during activity, there was no upregulation, no metabolic optimization, uh, no enhanced benefits from the aerobic activity, even after years and years of aerobic training experience at the very highest levels of work capacity and conditioning in the uh, endurance frame of exercise. So why would you think that 12 weeks or so is going to have any beneficial metabolic or fat burning effects? Or even more importantly, why would you think that with your limited time spent in the gym, that doing a little more cardio with the time you have is going to sculpt your body or help your metabolism burn fat? Answer, it doesn't. So use your time in the gym efficiently. Go ahead, buddy. Yeah, this, this study actually blew me away the first time I saw it. Because, I mean, this is like the best endurance athletes on the entire planet. And, and they're getting no metabolic up uh, regulation from, from their training. And they're training eight hours a day. So if you have a job in a real life and you don't want to train eight hours a day on top of that, like, and, and you're still not going to get any metabolic up, up uh, regulation from that. I mean, it's just, it just shows how incredibly useless it is long term. And, 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 you know, this goes back to what I said at the beginning, understanding the energy systems of aerobic versus anaerobic uh, training that all you can do, you create a more fuel efficient yeah. fat utilization machine. So even these people, they're training longer and longer, but getting less and less out of it. So if you remove all that, they have the same metabolism as a couch potato after 10, 11, 12 years of training. Whereas activated muscle tissue is going to act and perform in a much different metabolic framework. And people don't seem to understand that, especially trainers. And that just breaks my heart. But I want to talk, we're going to finish now talking about situational hypermetabolism. What is it? Uh, I talk about it all the time. Andy knows what it is. We know when and how to use cardio to a certain cosmetic advantage. So, uh, short-term physiological change, we talk about the three realms of time, the immediate, the residual, and the cumulative, all right? Well, short-term physiological change, if a certain kind of exercise is new, there can be a brief corresponding change in metabolic and biochemical response to that as well, but it's going to be brief. Uh, it, this kind of thing can happen with prescription drugs as well. The other element of situational hypermetabolism is sudden acute environmental change that forces an adoptive response. So let me 
take those scientific terms, put them in real world understanding. Okay, I like going for walks, but I don't do it during the Canadian winter because I'm a diva. I don't want to get cold and I don't want to get snowed on and all the rest of it. But I also know the old Tom Platt's quote, which was awesome in this regard, is you have to get out of shape in order to get into shape. And that was a brilliant, intelligent quote that I don't even think he realized how brilliant it was at the time. But I know by taking all that time off from going for my walks that when I start them up again, then I'm going to get an initial hypermetabolic bump from doing so. But there's more to it. So I start that when the weather changes around March, and then by the time I go to Aruba, I've already had a cosmetic fat-burning effect that I know is not going to last, but it's serving me properly. Now, let me just talk about for a second so I can explain the second example. What is butter? Butter is a saturated fat. What do we know about saturated fat? We know that it's solid at room temperature. You take your butter out of the fridge and you want to spread it on your toast. How do you do that? How do you make your butter soft, Andy? I mean, we don't eat butter heat anymore. It up. Right. Heat it, up. heat it up. So how do you melt butter? You put it in heat. So if I take a pad of butter out of my fridge and put it on a plate and on a 35 degree day in the Kelowna sun, uh, for people in the States, 90 degree day. I leave it out on my deck for a few hours. What happens to that butter? It melts. Well, what do you think human body fat is composed of? It's saturated fat. So when I go to Aruba, a sudden acute environmental change forces an adoptive response that's hypermetabolic because I go out in the sun, I walk in the sun in Aruba along the beach, which attracts even more sun, what happens inside my body is my body has to cool the skin. So I'm getting a fat burning hyper effect because that my butter, my human body butter is melting in the heat because it's not used to it. And I get a hyper metabolic bump from doing that. And I sure wish I could explain that to the people I see when I travel the hot, sunny environments who are inside the hotel gyms on ellipticals looking out the window at the beach. Unbelievable un friggin believable that they don't understand the payoff. Uh, even today, um, comments on the video we posted earlier of you doing the long bar preacher curls, people were saying, you know, how good we looked. That's because of the situational hypermetabolic effect of the tan. So how do you melt butter? You put it in heat. How do you melt human body fat? You change its environment, sudden acute environment. So, by the time I go to Aruba, I've had a one-two punch of situational hypermetabolic effects, and then I can go to Aruba. I can I come back from Aruba, and every time in the last few years, people say, wow, you look like you lost weight. Did you diet when you were there? No, I know what I'm doing when I'm there. I do a refeed, which fills out my muscles, and I also stay in the sun, get some color, get the situational sudden acute environmental change. Um, that forces the adoptive response of hypermetabolism. So I'm burning through the food in a thermogenic way and my body's responding in a thermogenic way to the sudden climate change as well. And that's the explanation. So all this aerobic myth of fat loss, uselessness of warming up with cardio equipment for weight training workouts, situational hypermetabolism. It's all in my book, The Able Approach or the Program Design Masterclass. Tie it up, buddy, and then we'll get to some really good comments yeah. that people have. Uh, obviously, I, I have a dog, Bob. Everyone, uh, well, some people know Bob, but I walk him year-round, but uh, this time of year, we get out for, for longer, longer walks and hikes more often. So I definitely get, um, you know, a, a an upregulation in, in metabolism just from that, right? Uh, walking longer, more often. Um, and yeah, it, it, I definitely lean out a little bit more from that. But that's how cardio works the best. Um, we're already lean. So, I mean, it, it, it just helps us to get a little bit leaner for a short period of time. We don't use it as a method to stay lean year round. Or to lose uh, weight to begin with. Yeah, yeah and uh, that's the biggest difference between how we apply it and how most people apply it, right? So. Awesome. Let's get to the comments because there's some really good comments and thank you folks for hanging around for the comments. So Byron, my client that you just saw, I'm glad he was able to join us. I kind of asked him at the gym, hey, can you join us? So um, 
He's just saying he's never had his body shred fat like it is right now. It's just melting off. Oh, there's that word, butter melting again. No cardio, eats carb-based diet, fat loss. Hmm, go figure. It's funny. I get excited when I watch people like Byron and I can see them, Byron and Ollie and the people I posted, uh, because you can see the excitement in their own eyes. They're finally getting results by not killing themselves. They finally have this math equation that doesn't even seem real compared to what they've heard. It's like, wait a minute, I'm not starving. I got energy. I'm like, and I've lost 50 pounds in three months. This is like ridiculous. So I'm glad you could join us, Byron, and uh, add your two cents. Hold on. Maybe there'll be some questions for you as well. So uh, I'm going to go all the way back down to that uh, uh, Miranda because, um, you know, I promised I would get back to that. And Miranda's just saying, oh, this is going to let me. Not letting me show her comment here for some reason. Miranda uh, Schoenfeld recommends general aerobic warm up prior to lifting to increase blood flow and core temperature. I would consider that cardio though, and it's still wrong. Go ahead and read Gambetta again, Andy. Hey, hey, here's here's why, Miranda. Up. Here's why, Miranda. And yeah, Gambetta says too much emphasis is placed on raising the core temperature and heart rate in the warm up. The main physiological objective is neural activation and getting everything firing to prepare for the more intense work to follow. So, um, and that's that's yeah. why we have a Scott Abel GPP, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, Rick Romano just say, and I do the GPP from following you. That's all I need. Of course, that's all anyone needs mm -hmm. for sure. And then some warm-up um, sets of, of whatever yeah, your first exercise is. Yeah. Physical rehearsal. So. Yeah. Uh, Marie, one of my new clients, is saying, oh, boy, I need this lesson. You and so many others, Marie. I'm not sure why Miranda's comment's not posting. Maybe she's not with us right now. Um, Rick's just saying the only cardio I do now is just long walks. Uh, yeah, and I don't even count those. You know, I really don't count those as, like, a concerted effort to lose fat. So they're just yeah. it's an activity. Um, Laura Lee's just saying... When it comes to post-concussion syndrome, oh, okay, the concussion is healed, but this lingering post-concussion lingers. How long am I stuck? Light cardio with weightlifting will help. Obviously, a much lower weight. Oh, that's a, yeah, that's a tough question. I mean, obviously, you're not going to do a lot of sudden bending over and standing up, uh, things like that, which will, you know, change cranial pressure, and you don't want to be doing things like that too much, but you should be able to do uh, you know, um, single side work, uh, things like that, um, lying and sitting work, um, that's not going to put uh, too much uh, extra cranial pressure. Obviously, you don't want to go too close to failure as well to build up, also build up cranial pressure, but it depends on the degree of damage. Um, you know, a lot of neck massage will help there, Laura Lee, believe it or not. Uh, that'll really help a lot and it'll free up a lot of blood vessels and things like that. So, and then Jared's just saying, uh, oh, I can't show his either. Hmm. Okay. Jared's just saying he had a gentleman at the gym remark how he looked lean and if he did cardio. Jared just said, nope, just proper diet and weight training. And then, of course, the man said it must have great genetics. Uh, didn't respond and just left the conversation at that. So you're more polite than I am, but uh, that's because I figure as an expert I owe it to someone to explain the, the conversation to them. Go ahead, buddy. Comment on that one. Yeah, I mean, I I definitely get that a lot too. People think I'm, you know, some exception, um, and not the rule, right? But hmm. uh, I am I am the rule. Um, it's just most people have been taught, uh, you know, the opposite about everything when it when it relates to exercise and diet, right? So. And I think, you know, we could argue that you're the exception, but not because of the reasons they think. You're not like, a, you're okay, you're a genetic specimen, as is Krista, blah, whatever, but you're the exception because you're one of the few people who gets the principles and follows yeah. them. That's the yeah. exception. You're not wandering around. People think spending time in the gym, results should happen. That's just oh, like yeah, opening. Yeah. No, definitely, yeah. They think I if think they just I, show up, they can, you know, the yeah, results will come. And, so. and of course, that's ridiculous. As I've always said, you know, um, when it comes yeah. to want to be experts, and you know, I've been flying in airplanes for thirty years. It yeah. doesn't make me a pilot. Yeah. So and unless you, know, you have very elite physical genetics, then yeah, nothing is is ever going to happen. And, yeah. And Stefan's just saying sick of the Fitbits and the 10,000 steps a day crap. Trainers and clients at my gym are obsessed with it. And that just shows, like I said earlier, certified doesn't mean qualified. It's amazing to me that trainers are not leading the way with this stuff. It's 
pathetic. Trainers should be the ones leading the way, not the ones following the herd. It's absolutely, you know, but then again, if you're not the lead dog, the view never changes. So, um, and then uh, Rick Romano is just saying uh, interval training shows it's more beneficial, somewhat like sprints or your Met training, exactly like Met training and sprints or my busy woman's train at home or the great glutes at home, body weight training, targeted specific uh, training, etc. Oh, Stefan is just saying the owner of my gym shames me for not doing cardio. He's a runner. Funny how I'm uh, leaner than him. Yeah, it's funny how people don't see that. Uh, one of the um, teachers, instructors of the classes at the gym said to Krista one day, you're here at the same time as me. I expect to see you in my class. And Krista didn't know how to respond. And I said to Krista, I said, tell her when she looks like you look, then you'll join her in her class. Like, yeah. I mean, Krista just shines in the gym. And here's someone who wishes she could look like Krista saying, I should see you in my class. And what you're talking about, Stefan, and, and what other people, what I'm talking about here is what we call paradigm blindness, where people think that their way of training is the right way just because it's their way of training. Um, you know, they're not using or understanding the science involved. So, uh, you know, you want evidence-based training, then we're going to show. And there's Aaron's comment from earlier. Missed my cardio again today. That makes 10 years now. Aaron is also... Uh, one of my clients who's lean and ripped year round. I didn't have any pictures of you, Aaron, uh, to put on here. I didn't know you'd be on or I would have used you as well. So um, Zaf is just saying playing squash. Would you recommend cardio help with the sport? Uh, a little bit. You'd be better off with doing some kind of combination training to get uh, stronger, faster, more agile, what they call SAQ, speed, agility, quickness training. Um, you can find out about that in um, Gambetta's book or uh, even J.C. Santana's book. Uh, good about that. So, um, And I won't spend too long on this comment because I don't really – I'm not in that world. But uh, Degas is just saying, look how miserable bodybuilders look closer to the competition, twice a day cardio, drugs, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, and doing it wrong, starvation, and, and all the rest of it is is pretty silly. So, um, you know, I don't want to spend too much time talking about that world. I'll do a webinar entirely about that world another time and my time in it and things like that. I was actually going to write a book about it, and I was going to call it uh, My Years in a Gorilla Suit, um, you know, and talk about the steroids and all the rest of it. But, uh, you know, but, um, you know, to be fair, you know, I was a chartered member and president of the hardcore bodybuilding company at one time. So, you know, um, everything that I would talk about is things I was guilty of myself. So got to own it. Um, but that's important too. Um, Laura Lee's just saying, thank you. Two months out from the gym has been long. Yeah. When it's a lifestyle for sure. It would be when I had my back surgery, Laura Lee, way back in 2000, not only was I out of the gym for over a year, but I was horizontal for about six or eight months. I couldn't even sit up to eat. So, um, yeah, I can, I can relate to that. Uh, I can relate to that comment more than, you know, um, so that's really important stuff. So, um, Andy, question for you. How long did it take you to get in the shape you're in now uh, from your bulk photo before? Uh, when I bulked you up, that was years and years ago. And I think you already told that story, but go ahead and you can answer that uh, I, I think um, originally uh, uh, nine weeks, nine. I think. I got pretty ripped in about nine weeks nine straight, straight dieting, dieting, like no cheat days. Right? Um, um, my metabolism was pretty good at that point too, right? I mean, we had trained it by bulking up and then – you know, so it, it came off pretty, you know, pretty easy. Like Byron's did. Yeah. 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 And like I always say to Byron, too, is I said to Byron, the fact that you shed 50 pounds in three months and you're still shedding it just shows how much your body didn't want it and didn't need it. Because when, when yeah. you get to the end, your body will fight to hold on. You know, how, how often do we hear people talking about those last 10 pounds are so tough? Well, when your body doesn't want the weight, it doesn't try to hold on to it. It just surrenders mm -hmm. it freely. So, uh, you know, that's what we talk about with the anti-catabolic phase of, of diet protocol. So um, Lauren's just saying, and then we're way, way over time. So I'll finish after this. Uh, uh, Laura's just saying, I probably missed the information on this, Scott. So forgive me. How dare you be late? Uh, but why is 10,000 steps a day model not good? It's just superfluous. It has really no bearing on anything. If you go back and watch this lecture in the beginning, it's activity. So it's better than sitting on a couch, but it's not a magic number to aim at when you can do 
other things. I uh, just started using my Fitbit to check my steps and it does make me move more. Mm. I did a whole webinar on this, Lauren. Be careful because the research shows that using Fitbits is actually demotivating, not motivating. Uh, it starts out as a crescendo of a motivational pattern and then it crashes real suddenly. Um, there's a study, uh, university, just type in, uh, do a Google search, University of Pittsburgh Fitbit study, and uh, you'll see that people who don't use them do better provided they understand and or follow, even by accident, rules of exercise physiology and nutrition. So that's important as well. But um, I believe in the qualitative inside out stuff. I believe enough of the North American diet mentality madness of outside in dictation like 10,000 steps and everything else, this many carbs, this many calories, all of it outside in, all of it saying don't take your body into account, don't listen to your body, don't pay attention to the things that actually matter. Those are the things that actually matter. And in my book, The Able Approach, I talk about internal versus external cues. So uh, hopefully that helped that for you, um, uh, Lauren. And then Domino's just saying when he was training for dragon boat racing, he did mainly a program like my Met training and was fairly successful. Yeah, I have several um, trainings that I call combat compatible Met programs. So they're compatible. Like I have a, I have one client who's a gymnast uh, who's getting ready to compete in some uh, aerobic um, um, agility stuff. What do you call it? Cirque du Soleil kind of stuff. Um, so I have compatible programs for other sports. Uh, where they use weight training instead of, uh, you know, this whole cardio thing. So tie it up, buddy, and uh, we will. Uh, we're way over time, so tie it up yeah, for me. Um, and, uh, getting and staying lean is all is all diet strategy. I mean, you're you're not going to uh, you know pedal your way lean. If you do, it's not going to last. It's not going to be sustainable. So, uh, you know, it's it's all about diet strategy. That that's what's that's your meat and potatoes when it comes to getting and staying lean for the rest of your life. Um, aerobic work, it, it just, it, it'll help you to get a little bit leaner for a short period of time and, and that's it. So that's and really, you saw, yeah. And you saw the research and what Andy's yeah. talking about, you can read in my book, understanding metabolism, what Andy means when he says diet strategy, he means metabolism more so than nutritional approaches, yeah. even though we've both gone vegan and we're both benefiting from that tremendously. Um, so that's it. So that's folks, uh, all in all, um, that is the aerobic myth of fat loss. Um, but maybe the third, fourth, fifth time I've done this presentation. It's funny. I did this presentation once back in 2009 at a university and they were getting, uh, their diploma degree in fitness and they couldn't hang with me for 10 minutes on basic, basic stuff. I had all kinds of young lady students putting up their hand, but our professor says we need to do 45 minutes of cardio and our, and they were just so confused and so disappointed. And, and I couldn't believe I was actually in an academic setting and I'm presenting all this research and uh, that's paradigm blindness for you folks. Um, so the aerobic myth of fat loss, get off the treadmill, get off the elliptical, Get off the Stairmaster. If you don't know what a proper training program looks like, hire someone who does. Uh, but that's the aerobic myth of fat loss. I had to represent it because I see really good, nice people trying so hard at the gym and they're doing everything in the wrong way, uh, in the wrong order, and they don't uh, understand any of the science. So that's the science of the aerobic myth of fat loss. Hope it benefited you all. And I'll hope to see you next week. And then uh, just a Curious announcement. And remember, go and watch the beginning of, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Meathead and what I had to say about him. But uh, upcoming uh, very, very soon, you heard of the movie Vegas Vacation. Well, I'm about to go on the vegan vacation and uh, I'll be including you guys all along the way in that. Is um, Cousin we'll Eddie going to be there? What's that? Is Cousin Eddie going to be there? Yeah, well, <laughs> Well, we'll see who shows up, uh, but that should be interesting. Um, so when people say it's uh, they find it hard to eat on the road and travel and stuff, I'm going to uh, debunk that uh, right from the get-go. So that should be fun if you want to join in. I might uh, probably do one more webinar next week. I was going to do women, food, and breast cancer, but we'll see if I have uh, the research put together by that time. So, uh, Andy, thanks for being here again, bud. I'll see you Thank tomorrow you. for coffee. We'll see you later, uh, everyone. See everybody and we will see you next time.